Welcome to uh, Repulsive TV, uh, episode number seven. Thank you for sticking around if you've been here since the beginning, and if this is new for you, thank you for tuning in. My name is uh, Ralphie Repulsive. I'm the bass player slash singer for a band called The Order of the Fly. Sitting to my right, your left, is my buddy Tom. He's the guitar player for The Order of the Fly. He also has uh, had a legacy in being in other bands, such as Cadaver Pudding, Band of the Dead, and uh, was the drummer for one show at a cancer benefit uh, for End, my other band. So he is my resident comic buddy. And today is officially National Comic Book Day. So for the in honor of that, we're gonna discuss comics, maybe some records too. And uh, so yeah, so buckle up. And if you're into comics, good. If you're not, get into them, because we're gonna start discussing them, so we'll leave you with a bunch of homework. By the time you watch this, it won't be National Comic Book Day anymore, but that's okay. <laughs> because every day should be National Comic Book Day, mm -hmm. so go out and read a goddamn comic. That's right, and every Wednesday is new National Comic Book Day, so go and replenish your supply every Wednesday. I, myself, am a huge comic fan. Uh, I've been into comics since as far back as I can remember. It's probably pretty much how I learned how to read. Um, the first specific hey, uh, comic that I can remember um, ever really um, reading was an issue... Probably of the Avengers, because I remember seeing the Hulk, and the one thing that I remember about it is Hulk was screaming, and there was like a line of saliva between <laughs> the top of his mouth and the bottom of his mouth, and I was just like blown away at like the detail of that. It like tripped me out. And then um, after that, I remember my mom would let me buy comics uh, as long as I read them, because she would try to teach me how to read. She was uh, um, she was an English teacher, so she was always interested in making sure I knew how to read and liked books and reading and everything, and comics were always looked down upon in our family as this, the lesser, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's for, it's not good, you know, it's bad, it rots your mind, like, bad TV, so I had to... <laughs> Sadly, in most families, not just Yeah, yours, I know, yeah. it's, I don't know why that still pervades, that's what we should talk about, is the, the art form itself, right. so, I learned how to read, uh, reading Green Lantern, because I, I remember asking my mom what corpse meant, and she was like a dead body, <laughs> and it was because it was the Green Lantern core, but I sounded it out as a little kid corpse, so for, like, years, I thought... There was a whole like series of Green Lantern about like a zombie like Green Lantern, and then when what was the guy's name? The zombie Green Lantern actually it was like Drix or something like that. Or yeah, the, the, the Black Lantern. Yeah, no, no, not the Black Lantern. Or but back, even before that, it was like in the Steve Englehart era. Oh, there was like a zombie. I should Google it. Zombie. Someone, someone Google. Yeah, it. like a, zo a dead a zombie <laughs> Green Lantern. So <laughs> I thought that was like the one I read about. It was it confused me immensely until I figured out oh core. It's like a whole bunch of uh, Green Lanterns. It makes Green Lantern sound a lot cooler, yeah, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah, and uh, the news is uh, Grant Morrison starting on Grant and, uh, Green Lantern. I would, I would read Green Lantern again. That's true. Me too. That's going to pull me in 100%. That's what I need is I need some Grant Morrison. Let me take my keys off. So I, jingle jangle. I'm currently rereading Grant Morrison's Animal Man because it's Grant Morrison. And Animal Man's okay, but... Animal Man was sort of his early, like, uh, not as awesome stuff. It wasn't really Not as until, weird. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't Even until... Even though it was. Doing, yeah, it was sort of like it went like Animal Man. Uh, did Animal Man come before Doom Patrol? Have you seen the Doom, Doom Patrol uh, preview? Yeah. Or not preview, but well, like... the uh, leaked footage, footage and oh stuff. Oh my yeah. god, I can't wait to see it. Although, I, the only bummer... Is that I think they're following the Gerard Way version and not the Grant Morrison, yeah. but the Gerard Way is a wannabe Grant Morrison, so it's like following a copy of a copy. So right. whatever. But okay. The kids will like it, right? <laughs> True. Kids will. So, um, the first thing I wanted to talk about today, since uh, okay, here's here's the, this will be the agenda. We're going to talk about comics specifically. I want to talk about indie comics because that is where my uh, passion lies, uh, and also. I want to talk about both new and old stuff that influenced both of us. Uh, Tom has a wide uh, or a very good breadth of knowledge about ind independent comics, more current stuff, and I've got the sort of legacy '80s, '90s era stuff because I'm older. I'm an old man. We weren't going to talk about that, but <laughs> it's good. I'm, I good own job. it. I'm, I own it. And I'm proud of it. We're in '75, baby. '75 and the pink shirts. We're ready to go. Oh yeah, I'd like to call attention to my beautiful. Uh, this is my vampire stepdad shirt. That I bought from Square Wave Clothing, who has since gone out of business. Sadly, I, they had a. I was supposed to take a picture of it and post about it. <laughs> Vampire stepdad requested, so I do have one of these shirts. I love this damn shirt, and they had an awesome retro wave shirt I wanted to buy, but they went under. They uh, had a family illness or something and decided to stop doing their 
Ouch. Good shot, dude. I know. It's sad. Sucks. Very sad. Hopefully, hopefully they're okay. I don't know them personally or anything, but I hope wish them well. Um, so just to start, for anybody that's interested in comics right now, please, I, I'm going to implore you guys. I want to promote a product. <laughs> Today's commercial is going to be for Alterna give me, Comics. Give me the hat. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Rock this. You can be, we'll be, we're going to be spokesmen. There's a great new comic company. So if you're interested at all in independent comics, um, comics, one of the biggest problems that I've, I've noticed with comics is, A, uh, the price point for an intro, introductory reader is too much. Four bucks is too much. The, the only like, good price point I would say for an introductory reader besides what you're going to mm -hmm. talk about is that Image Comics will take their first trade of a series and do it as $10 yeah, instead of like 17 or 18 and stuff. That's cool. But yeah, like you said, otherwise $4, even $3 is kind of close, but the yeah. $4 intros is kind of hard. Yeah, that's what I feel. Like, like, okay, so here's, here's my... Okay, we'll talk about... This is what I think is the problem with comics right now. They say that there's... it's differing opinions on whether comics as an industry is doing well or doing terribly. If you look at the actual numbers, it's really tanking. If you look at the money, it's doing okay, and the reason why it's doing okay is because the big two, Marvel and DC, have realized that as the numbers are shrinking and the audience shrinks, they're just going to keep raising the prices so that the that it looks like on, the, on paper they're bringing in the same or more amount of revenue, but the problem is you're getting less and less readers. Guys like my age in their 40s who've been collecting comics their whole life are kind of getting out of it because I mean it's just expensive. In the old days I used to be able to drop 20 bucks a week and get pr probably like 7 8 comics. Now that's like maybe 3. 3 or 4. And I really have to like them and the quality I feel is kind of dipped. I don't really see th well that's a blanket statement. There's some that's great, some that's not amazing, but I don't know, it kind of depends on your taste, but for the big 2 I feel like the quality is pretty much dipped. Especially Marvel. I won't even touch a Marvel anymore. Yeah, I honestly haven't picked up a Marvel book in quite a while. The, I've heard that the new Venom title is very yeah, good. Donnie, Donnie Gates is, good. is, is Donnie doing Cates a good job. Yep, but I, I hear good stuff about him. Uh, besides that, I really haven't heard anything about Marvel. No, me either. I know, and they, they uh, like my favorite, uh, like the new Fantastic Four I was pumped for, and then it came out and it was like a complete like typical Marvel overship sham like there's like 20 different variant covers like every store I've seen has like stacks like this thick of unsold Fant Fantastic Four number one should be like flying off the shelves but it's like an $8 book they also gave it to Dan Slott yeah another so. reason why I won't touch it <laughs> Dan Slott sucks I mean he's not that he can be good I don't know he, I just he don't can. think he's, an, he's he's part of the new breed of writers for Marvel that is very into this like sort of it's like there's a whole generation of writers right now for Marvel that are that the their intro to comics was like uh, Scott Pilgrim. Right. So it's all very self-referential, very like breaking the fourth wall, wacky, hilarious, wannabe manga kind of silly humor. And they so they make it almost like a parody of itself. So rather than have Wolverine be like a badass hardcore Wolverine, that's too that's too macho and toxically male, so then instead you're going to make it very like self-referentially funny, or you're going to introduce a dumb character like Honey Badger, who's a clone of a clone. That character, Have you seen that character? I honestly have not. Honey Badger is a clone of um, X-23, of Laura. Uh -huh. So Laura became like uh, Wolverine, right. and then she was also a clone, because she's a clone. Well, they retconned it, now she's the daughter of Wolverine. Right, yeah. But the, she was cloned, and... Um, has a now like this little like nine year old version of herself who is called the honey badger. Come on, man. Come on. Get out of here. You that's just the quickest way to lose a reader like me. You just like throw that in the trash. That's my buddy Steve <laughs> has this theory has this feeling on pops, Funko Pops. Yeah. That they're two dog dog two toys. He just wants to plant them <laughs> everywhere. So <laughs> when they became hugely famous, I thought they're cool. I like them but Steve's like, nope, not having time. And that's the way I feel about any sort of, like, you can't in, you can't make a character like Honey Badger and expect comic readers like myself. I'm sorry, I just that's just not what I'm into. It's hard enough for me to get into the big two, unless you're talking, like, the classic Jack Kirby runs of anything. Anything Jack Tur Kirby was on, I'll collect. And, you know, the, tra the old trades of, like, Fantastic Four, for as wacky as they were and as obviously geared towards a younger audience, they're just, there's a, there's a, uh, a sincerity and a integrity to them that they just now it's like they try to make the thing into a big oafy like sort of uh, comic relief character. I don't. I just don't like that. The thing is the man. You know, <laughs> don't mess with that guy. He's right. like the, they won't let him smoke cigars anymore because it's promoting tobacco. Strike number one. I only it, like cigar smoking superheroes. 
It doesn't help, though, like you were saying, where you walk into comic shops and you see stacks and stacks of Fantastic Four number one, yeah. that Marvel's selling point is, you know, the one in 25s, the one in 50s, the one in 1000s, yep. and this and that. And you got to so order, they, like, a massive amount. Yeah, they buy the garbage book of, you know, uh, the regular print. I don't mean this garbage book, but you know what I mean. Uh, they buy ton of the regular yep. one to get this and that. And it's the same thing with, because uh, I, I worked at a comic shop for quite a while. And the way Marvel does it, at least when, you know, a few years ago, uh, you would have to increase your number of purchases from like a random book, like Squirrel Girl number six. You have to then, a lot of people like Squirrel hey, Girl. Yeah, and I there's mean, nothing wrong with that. It's inexplicably but, popular yeah. for whatever reason. <laughs> but. You have to take, you know, however many you ordered of Squirrel Girl number six and then order 25 more than that to get the variant of some other completely unrelated Marvel title. Right. You know, and yeah. it's just, it's obnoxious. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's a, just a, it's like they did the same thing. I, when I was, when I was a kid in the nineties in, in uh, high school, I was big into the indies, the black and whites. Yeah. I'd be like, would almost like exclusively, if it had color, I like poo pooed it unless it was like Eclipse comics. And um, the big thing then was Marvel was wrecking the industry with their, like, sort of, like, they were they were all in with Diamond. Diamond right. um, Diamond kind of wrecked the industry. We could do a whole, like, we could do a whole what, episode. We could fix the comic industry. <laughs> I think what we should do is spitball right. some ideas to save it. Right. But one idea to save it next is... Next month. Yeah, next month we'll do... Yeah, we're going to do once a month comic shows. Yeah. But... W- <laughs> maybe. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it could be. But the... The man that is saving comics, or is trying his best, his damnedest, is Peter Samedi, the publisher of Alterna Comics, baby. If you are interested in comics whatsoever, look these guys up. Because they he ha- you can order online from his Etsy store, or even better, if you want to help out the small business store, brick and mortar, mom and pops, go to your local comic shop and tell them, can I please order some Alterna Comics. Each one of these things is a buck fifty. That's the old school price point that I remember. I can totally afford that. In fact, I can afford so much. I bought every single freaking issue that they've ever put out. Yeah, every <laughs> thus far, every uh, comic. I've period. got them all. I got the whole thing, man. I went nuts. I gotta collect them. So, I mean, I could just keep going. There's a stack here that's like f- a foot tall. Like, yeah, it's literally. out of frame and it's, it's a lot. Yeah, it's too big. Too big to frame up. But <laughs> so, so here's, uh, man, it's just so good. So let me. So the, my first intro to this was Mother Russia. It was done by Jeff McComsey. So here's my suggestion. If you're gonna if you're gonna dive into this, this comic is fantastic. It's only three issues. This is the cool thing that this guy does. Okay, so Peter Samedi, nicest guy. He I remember the first time I I got into this because I saw some news blur probably on like comic book resources saying yeah. this guy's publishing a newsprint. Okay, Nomura Uno, yes, go back to newsprint. Every comic book publisher, do it. It looks better. I don't care. I mean, here's here's what we do. Here's what you you guys do. You publish the pamphlet comics like this. On newsprint, all right, newsprint, and make them cheap, like this, a buck fifty. This guy's doing like thirty-two page freaking full color comics for a buck fifty, all right. That's not four bucks. I can buy three for one of your stupid Marvels. Then you do the trades on the fancy paper if you want. The trades are gonna sit on a bookshelf and they look nice right. and they can be perfect bound and they can look really good. That one, but to, the, for those of us that want the story immediately, just make it cheap. <laughs> this is fine. I'll buy this and a trade paperback on great quality paper. So that's number one. Number two is get them out of the comic book shops. Peter Samedi is smart and he realized, okay, comic book shops, if you're going to a comic book shop, you're gonna, you already are sold. It's not, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get new readers that way. It's been, that's been killing the industry since the 90s. Honestly, like I love comic book shops because they're cool and it's fun to go to a place with all the stuff that I love. But if you were like me as a little kid, my mom wouldn't have taken me to a comic book shop. Take you down to 7-Eleven, you buy yes, them off the racks. exactly, yeah. I bought them off, uh, I bought them at 7-Elevens, I bought them at drug stores, I bought them at the Safeway, which was like the grocery store near me. So, I mean, that was how you got comics. And why does Archie only exist? Why does Archie Comics exist? Nobody likes Archie Comics. No. But it's at every freaking checkout aisle of every supermarket. Switch that out for Marvels. Every kid would buy a reprint. You've got like 70 years of reprints you could do. Pick a freaking issue of the Fantastic Four classic and a kid will read it. Just put it in that little Archie Digest. Get rid of the Archies. Throw them in the trash. Nobody wants them. Nobody wants that. That's trash. Even the guy, the kids that watch Riverdale on TV don't want to go buy Archie. They don't even know that Archie it's, exists. It's not Riverdale. It's, it's not, not the same those thing. Those kids, though, I guarantee you, because I talk to uh, teenagers a lot <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> he's a d- Don't go filing any claims. Mm-hmm. He's a d- And uh, I'm bleeping that out, because that's <laughs> top secret. But so, yeah, honestly, like, I freaking... Uh, 
I t- I, no, nobody reads comics. None of these kids read comics. You know what they read is manga. That sells Which in the is, millions. Yeah. Why? What is the difference? Why do you not? Why cannot American? Why can't Marvel and DC figure out what works for manga, but can't? I don't know. They they they're stuck on this weird old business model that's not working. It's got to. They need to shake it up. I feel like the closest thing they have to that when it comes to selling in like a Seven Eleven and things like that are the giant sized books that they're that DC's now yep. putting out in Walmart. Oh yeah, that's the closest the best. thing. Bought every one of them and so far. I haven't been able to find one Dude, because people are going and buying them quickly. Walmart. Yeah, and they sell out fast. Yeah, they're five bucks. That's good. See, DC's all right, but even there, it's in the little like Magic the Gathering nerd aisle. Right. So you right. already have to go. You got to get it in front of people that aren't going specifically for that thing. I think the only people buying those, honestly, are, are you and me that yeah. are like, ooh, let's go buy the new comic book because we know it exists. Yeah, the 30 so, and 40 year olds yeah. that know what's going Man, on you gotta and get collect the kids. comics already. You got, yeah. Here's what you got to do. Okay, this is the other thing. This is price pointed for a kid, but this is not kid stuff. When you're a kid, you don't want to read cutesy kid stuff. Nobody, No kid wants to read that. Kids want to read Wolverine punching people in the face with knives on his hand. Yeah. That's badass. When you're when you're an 11 year old, you're like, oh hell yeah, seeing somebody like get their head chopped off with a samurai sword right. is okay. You want that. You want that as a kid. Yes. That is what a boy wants. I'm sorry, man. That is what I wanted. That was I was all in and you'd see that violence in comics and you'd be like, "Oh, this is amazing." Kids don't want to read cutesy cutesy stuff. Some do. That's okay. You can do cutesy stuff like this issue of Psycho KO is kind of cutesy and then you got some other ones like uh, uh, Lilith Dark or was that her name? <laughs> Let me just flip through my gigantor stack of comics. <laughs> oh man, there's so many good good comics. Mr. Crypt, this one's for kids. Really good. Really funny. Actually, Danny, this reminds me of Hank. Give that to Danny. Danny, that's your, your present. That's for you. Lilith Speak. Dark, actually. Okay, yeah, it is Lilith Dark. Lilith Dark is an excellent young kid all ages title so you got little girls Order these comics. He's doing a promotion right now called Alternaween. So go look up, <laughs> and, he's, and he's making them even cheaper so you can get a bunch of them to give out as Halloween candy. I mean, how cool is that? That's fantastic. That's, I mean, dude, can you imagine getting a comic in your freaking Halloween thing? I oh would 100% God. hand out comics if I had that chance. I've got like, even more. This is like half of my stack, but I'm just moving it out of the way because it's getting hot. You know, when it comes like to, to indies and like kid comics and stuff like that, um, Albatross with Eric Powell. Oh, yeah, I He's love doing it. Uh, this the in... Yeah, in October, so he's doing Spook House again. Oh, Or good. Spook Show. The one with uh, Rob Zombie? No, oh. it's uh, it's his own kid title that tells little short stories for kids that are all dark and, you know, gross-themed or haunted-themed or whatever it may be. Love it. But um, he did a short run of it, but this is the second run that he's doing, and he's doing one every week during October, so there's only four issues. But it's fantastic, so and it's cool kid stuff. Kids will really enjoy it, even though it is on the cuter level. Yeah, see, and so I think that kids do like the cute stuff, but little little boys, man, they want they don't want this stuff written for kids. You read that like old Claremont X Men run? That yeah. is not written for kids. And that's the other thing that has driving me crazy lately is that everybody is up in arms about guys my age criticizing these stupid freaking titles coming out because they're like, "Hey, it's a kids medium. What are you doing as an adult re- reading this?" Let me tell you something. As a forty-three year old gentleman, my entire life has been spent reading comics and trying, and everybody in the comics industry trying to. Uh, give comics the validity of any other medium. It's no different from filmmaking or novels mm-hmm. or any other medium of, of receiving a, information. In, in other cultures like France, Belgium, Japan, everybody reads them. They're, it's, not like a, it's not like you're a kid because you read comics. There's a marriage of visual art, which can be very high-end, uh, like Mobius and freaking mm-hmm. Monera and guys like that, and then really high-end writing, and um, it does not have to be for kids. And all of a sudden, the big two want to make it back for kids again. And they're criticizing anybody my age that has any sort of critique to offer on their dumb comics. And it's like, you guys, you've, you've, the past 50 years has been spent trying to make this a valid art form. Not just a, a, a product that kids right. want to buy. Right. Although kids, getting kids in it makes lifelong readers. I am in, I'm still Definitely. reading comics. At, we started 40s, as kids, yeah. And I have no intention of ever stopping because I love this stuff. But yeah, we, you start as kids. It's a good entry point. But I mean, I started reading novels as kid as a kid too. It's not like that's a kid right. form. Maybe the book's content might change over time, but you know, my vocabulary stretched <laughs> maybe by five or six words over the past yeah. forty years. But right, you know, 
You know what I mean? It's but just, see, I don't uh, like them to do the that. problem is, and like the big two's response to that is making their edgier titles with a different imprint. Right. Like I was telling you earlier, yeah. DC started black a black label imprint and they just released their first book, which is called Batman Damned. And it was a great book. Libra Mayhaus had some of the best art I'd seen in a really long time in a Batman book. Mm -hmm. But everyone got offended by that because you can kind of see the outline of Batman's penis. Yeah. And it was a like, huge that's why, that's deal. That's the selling point of this thing, though. Honestly, yeah. that's the one thing I knew about this comic is that you got Bat Dong. It's, it's, Batwang. Yeah, Batwang. No, 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 Batwang no, no, 2018. No, 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 Batwang. If, if I could get that CGC graded, I wanted to say first appearance of Batwang. Like, oh, on the top. Oh, so good, yes. I would pay so much money to have that happen. But you get that new, darker label, and people still complain about the product. Yeah. There's no winning at no. all. At all. That's and, why you got to let it... That's why the indies conquer. Yeah, it's 100%. Just, I think the problem the problem with Marvel and DC both have is that they're kind of tired. You've got a bunch of these sort of I don't I mean DC like I read something some blurb where uh, Sean Gordon Mur Gordon Murphy somebody was asking why doesn't he do anything for Marvel and he was kind of half jokingly like Marvel can't afford me. That's not a joke, yeah, man. Yeah, no, he yeah, they he gets, gets paid a lot. Garbage tier artists. Yeah, and uh, no no offense on the artists. I mean they're better than me, but still it's like. <laughs> I, it's just like they you have to commit you, you have to be able to afford a high quality product so if you're gonna be like the full moon studios production of comics you can't pretend right. like you're putting out I don't know Disney quality stuff Disney owns the film rights but Disney doesn't really care do. at all yeah. about the comics they just they use the comics as like a in intellectual property farm they just want them to make stuff and that's why I think they keep Rather than making interesting new characters mm -hmm. uh, and giving them a shot, they just like constantly rehash stupid stories. And you're gonna like, okay, now Falcon's the Cap, now Cap's a Nazi. Up, oh, nope. But now Cap came back from a Cosmic Cube event, and really, Nazi Cap, who is the true Cap, is still stuck in a jail somewhere. So they never right. really did fix that. He's there somewhere. I hate that. That's oh, man, that's irritating. So what you got to do is you got to just stop buying Marvel and DC altogether, unless you're gonna buy the Grant Morrison Green Lantern, and then you buy uh, indie comics. Which are the greatest? So here's here I'm gonna give a few few select reviews because we probably got to wrap it up. How long have we been filming? Do you think? Perfect. Sweet. This we is gonna be this is gonna be good half hour. So, <laughs> first artist I'd like to discuss is if you're gonna pick up a comic book, <clears throat> spend twenty bucks and buy this baby, like a velvet glove cast in iron. If you've never read comics <clears throat> and you think you're like comics are like for kids, you read this comic and you will be disturbed out of your mind and have nightmares. This is. One of the darkest, dreariest, but also most beautiful comics. It's done by Daniel Klaus. Uh, he also did uh, Ghost World, which was made into a film starring uh, whoever and whoever. Uh, uh, Scarlett Johansson. So you got ladies, Black yeah. Widow. And what's the other girl's name? I don't remember. She was Enid. Steve Buscemi. Steve Buscemi. Anything Thank with you, Steve Buscemi, you got to watch. But uh, yeah, he. Uh, this this comic is fantastic, and it's sort of like a David Lynch movie put on paper it's very dark uh stark black and white art i don't know how how else to describe this without like really giving anything away but it's just this like story that's that's very surreal it's almost like a really bad dream that you've had so pick this one up if you're not into comics or think you're not into comics give this a shot the next one that like an idiot i don't have with me and i should have brought is <laughs> black hole by yeah. Charles Burns. Anything by Charles Burns, but specifically Black Hole. That's his like magnum opus. I was gonna compare the two art yeah. styles between there. Yeah. Yeah, both of them. They spill like I, I think both of them use like a whole bottle of black on per page. Yeah. And yeah, Charles India Ink goes through like. Oh, I know. It's got. I know they've got to be <laughs> cranking it through. Charles Burns is a. Um, he started in Raw Magazine, underground comic art stuff. His um, style is very like fifties sort of uh, referential, very like kitschy, kind of um, make almost a, not a parody, but utilizing the sort of look of the classic 50s romance comics and stuff like that and horror comics. Um, they're very thick brush lines, but some of the most like deeply intellectual, dark, uh, insightful comics. Uh, the two big ones that you need to check out are Black Hole, which uh, featured prominently in one of the the Planet of the Apes movies. I think they're actually making yeah. it into a film, like a Netflix series or something. Some Someone's making it. That's which I'm halfway excited for, but halfway sad for. Right. It's kind of like Stranger Things before Stranger Things took root. It's very, it's like a teenage, <laughs> it uses, yeah, it uses point. the sort of, yeah, it's like the allegory of like puberty and the weirdness of being a teenager uh, married to this sort of like mysterious plague that you don't, 
really have any explanation for, but it's sort of the idea of it's the outsider. Outs- I don't know how to describe it, man. You just got to pick it up. That's good bit. enough, yeah. Um, the other one that I couldn't get enough of was Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. <laughs> Jonah Vasquez is probably better known for Invader Zim. You see Invader Zim stuff everywhere, but oh my God, this is where he got his start. This was like his own self-published comic at first. I think he did it for like some school newspaper or some kind of th- something like that. Then he ended up uh, doing comics for slave labor in glorious black and white, where, where it ought to be. And this is a dark freaking comic, man. <laughs> yeah. It is so good. It is hilarious, though. F- laugh out loud like funny. No joke. I remember the sort of follow-up to this is based around this little kid that Johnny the Homicidal Maniac's neighbor is named Squee. Mm-hmm. And I remember the first time I, s- I found Squee, like, reading it in, like, a comic shop, like, actually laughing, like, cackling like an idiot. Like, it was, there was the, <laughs> the scene where, like, he's... He has to pee really bad, so he runs into a public restroom and he's peeing, and then it's like all of a sudden he just the guy in the stall starts screaming and like blood is like pouring out on the ground and, <laughs> and you just have this like face of this horrified little kid trying to like tiptoe away but still midstream. It sounds gross, but oh my god, I was like dying laughing. And th- and it, the the humor that he has is just very quirky and weird. It's like a lot of like goth industrial. This was like at the hot topic era of yeah. like late nineties, um, early eighties, so it was like you know, Nine Snails, Marilyn Manson, Ministry, all that like, kind of vibe was sort of like channeled through this. And then he did Invader Zim, which was a huge hit, uh, but I don't know. It's not my it's thing. It's because it was commercial. Yeah. You know? And he did I Feel Sick, too, which yeah, was after that, was which also was good. I Feel Sick was a character from Johnny, right. who was like one of the girls that got away. And it was only like two issues or something, but it was... Three issues. It was, and it's, it's never three? been collected. I don't know why. Ah, it's kind of strange. Beautiful art, and yeah. it's great, but... And then he did Filler Bunny. So he's got a lot right. of stuff. He does actual art. He's done like... He did a... Uh, my, uh, what's that band with uh, Jimmy Urin? Mindless Self-Indulgence. Mindless Self-Indulgence album cover. He does art, but he's and he's fantastic, but I wish he would get back into doing uh, a little comic piece yeah Another. they're they're doing uh, a new invaders in movie i believe is yeah what i it heard is. that was sort of like a relaunch of it yeah it's kind of funny much involvement he, has. he uh he went down to the studio i just saw the other day and mm-hmm. he took a photo because they have a, a banner out front for invaders in uh-huh. and it is drawn totally wrong like his his teeth are <laughs> wrong his antennae are in the wrong spot nice and he was like t- posting photos of it going this is not right i didn't draw <laughs> this what the hell is this what's going on i mean that's sort of the that's the classic see that oh that's another okay that's where you sign the paper and that's you get exactly the money right. you know who you know who would not have approved of that and it would have never have done that exactly. this guy dave sim cerebus boom okay now <clears throat> once once i get you into reading comics and you're like this is pretty pretty awesome I, I can get behind it this is really dark very intellectual when you're ready to sit down and sort of the equivalent of binge watching game of thrones is you're going to buy all the phone book versions they're called phone books because they're about the size of a phone book of uh they're Dave Sims magnum bro. opus. In fact, his is, is this is his life's work. This is a yeah. whole. Uh, this is a man's entire life's work. Is a 300 issue comic book named Cerebus that was entirely self published, entirely self promoted. It had this like meteoric. Oh, I don't know, a meteoric. Maybe a gradual rise and then a meteoric fall <laughs> because of this specific issue, which is sitting in my stack of doom here. Oh, dang it. Well, we're just going to have to keep powering through, and you're going to have to hit record again. We're just going to go past the 30-minute mark again. That's what happens. Hey, Jason, why don't you have a seat on the couch and join us? How you doing? Come on in, boo. Thing about Good to see you. I'll sit on that end, and no one will see me. That's All fine. Right, cool. We'll sit down. Actually, you know what you did have? I, I remember when we first met, you had a collection of the Morbius from the 90s. Yeah, and is that not being made into a movie, or he's popping up somewhere? He'll probably pop up somewhere. Morbius well, is a great character. pop up in the new Spider-Man. Oh, There's I hope so. I mean, that would be so good. Yeah. That would be great. That would be excellent. Frame? Yeah, he is out of frame, but he's right there. He's looking handsome as ever, though. It's true. Okay, this issue right here of Cerebus. So Cerebus was written and drawn by a guy named Dave Sim. Uh, uh, after he did about, I think, about maybe 70 issues or so. Shoot, I should fact check. I don't know how many Let's issues. Give or take. Yeah, so he did. Uh, they're collected in graphic novels. This is Cerebus. This is all dr- written and drawn by him. Yeah. <laughs> All right, recording. Wait, hold on. Magical. Real quick, the the computer. Oh no, the computer's like not even on, so I just want to make sure it's still. Nah, running. it's still going. Mm. You believe it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure, why not? I believe it. I keep second guessing it, and I'm right, just like, good. whatever. Good. We could jiggle the mouse to verify, but I think we're good. Seventy issues of Cerberus. Yeah, so I'm gonna guess like okay, maybe maybe even less. So Cerberus was written and drawn by Dave Sim, and then he realized 
uh, after the second trade paperback that he did, he needed some help. Uh, maybe he didn't even need some help, but he found a guy named Gerhard. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. I have no idea who's this. He was an architect, uh, architectural drawing kind of guy. He did the most amazing background, so he hired him specifically to do background. So the two of them completed the whole entire series. Um, and the backgrounds are just, uh, it is the most cinematic. This, this like really pushed the medium into a whole like experimental, very intellectual, very hard to digest. It takes multiple readings to catch all this stuff. I've read the whole thing through probably like, well, I've read the whole thing through twice, but really my favorite moment in it is um, the collected editions. There was a, a smaller sub uh, story line called Mothers and Daughters, and it was, there's four volumes one of his uh, mind, what is it? Women reads mind and or, uh, flight. Women reads minds. Those four. If you could find them on eBay, I think his uh, company is called Ardvark Vanaheim. If you could find them in print, get them. If you can't, uh, I'm sure they're on eBay. They are so fantastic. That it, the problem is that's like the 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 meat of the series, the real part of the series is right there. That's actually the climax of it. Then there's just this giant de denoma, kind of like weird epilogue almost. The last hundred issues or so is just this kind of like uh, intellectual just argument of, uh, about religion, about um, all kinds of just, it's just social commentary. He does like one whole book devoted to uh, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, one whole book uh, devoted to Ernest Hemingway, a big chunk of a book devoted to Woody Allen. It's very weird, but I mean, it's good. It's still good, but it, and it's sort of an a, like a analysis it, with a lot of references to what was currently going on in the comics world. Like Todd McFarlane is in it. He puts a lot of the comic creators in it. Alan Moore's in it. Rick Veach is in it. Um, but this is the this is the issue. If you ever read any issue and you want to just sort of see, if you dip your toe into this and see if this is something that you either would like or hate. This is the most polarizing comic book issue that had ever been published, ever, and it's issue 186, and it was it's in the book Reads of the four-volume set, and it has a famous essay that he wrote. I'm not going to say anything else about it, but you go ahead and Google it and see if it's something that you can get behind or, or take offense with, but it gives a, his sort of like analysis of feminism versus, um, I guess, modern Western thought and sort of like where the disconnect is and his version it's obviously it's a very antagonistic take on feminism, but uh, very intellectually well done. A lot of people have issues with it, and people will like uh, either call you a an all right Nazi for liking this, or think you're like an intellectual genius. I don't know. You, I'm leaving it up to you. You decide what you what you will. But that's that's definitely the issue uh, uh, that really um, brings in the most controversy. That whether or not you like his politics or his viewpoints on things, you cannot deny the guy's ability to craft a very multi-layered story with insanely good art and just push it to a point that uh, comics had never really been in and I don't think they've ever been again other than maybe some of the best of like the Japanese like mangaka type artists like the guy that did Akira. How, his name is. how early on in his career or in the character's career was their like uh, their tie-in story with the Ninja Turtles? That was I know him and Laird did a thing. Yeah. And stuff, oh, and that's and good like, to find too. And it, the cool thing about that is that he drew, wrote, and or he drew, like pencil and drew and right. inked the the um, character of Cerebus and did the lettering because the lettering is like a big thing for right. him too. So it's like the obvious art styles. Is, it's very cool to see it both. Right. Um, and he was a big champion of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because he kind of got his start in the late 70s and he was one of the first big self-publishers and champion of creators' rights. And when Laird and Eastman decided to start doing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, he was a big champion of them because they self-published. They did Mirage Studios, which is still going under Eastman. Or no, Laird, Peter Laird. Yeah, all newsprint, all black and white. It was part of that black and white explosion of the 80s. And um, they did a crossover issue. It was like a kind of time travel thing where Cerebus is in it, and I think that was probably, that was in the middle of, that would have been, I think it was like the late 80s, so it would have been pre the the Mothers and Daughters arc, so it would have probably been around like Church and State 2, I think, which is a big lead up. The problem with Cerebus, as far as a new reader goes, is I don't really care for Cerebus in volume one. It's very like wacky and sort of like, it's a comedy parody of, um, uh, what's his name's run on Conan? Uh, that famous artist I can't think of right now. The fantasy artist guy. 
Frazetta? No, not Frazetta. Vallejo? Not Vallejo. No, no, no. There's a famous... Oh, yeah, oh, dang it, I can't believe I can't think of his name. Uh, when I think of it, I'll just put it in like the little white letters. But in there, yeah. There was a famous run on Conan, and uh, so it was sort of started as a parody of that. Like, it was sort of, because it was around the time that um, Stevie Gerber was doing Howard the Duck, and it was sort of, Howard the Duck was the first, like, anthropomorphic little, like, wacky Mickey Mouse character, but in a real uh, environment. Like, all the other characters are drawn straight. Cerebus is like that. Cerebus is drawn like a little wacky cartoon character, but all the other characters are drawn photorealistically. Um, it was selling my Frank Wayne's clothes. Yeah. When you... Yeah. No. Nope. Uh, Google. Uh, cool did you? Oh yeah. Would you please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Google. Google. Yeah. Uh, comic. Uh, Conan comics artists. Frazetta did uh, the novel like covers, yeah. and he's famous for that. Yeah. Well, he's famous for a bunch of other stuff. But that, I mean, just John, the con. John Buscema. No. Nope. Uh, Barry Windsor. Barry Windsor Smith. Yeah, that's it. So Barry Windsor Smith did a famous run on Conan. Thank you. Thank thanks. you, Google. All right. Thanks, Google. Can I be the? Uh, yeah, you can be our uh, our little. Uh, You're our human Google. Producer here. Sweet. <laughs> Um, so definitely give Cerebus a chance, specifically those four volumes, but the problem is you got to start at the beginning to get all the references, because all these loose ends that he dropped in the beginning get tied up later. And I mean, he's an interesting guy. He's a very strange, reclusive dude. He's sort of like the, the uh, I don't know, he's just like a strange, reclusive dude. Now he's like a complete ascetic. He basically adopted, he found religion towards the end of the series. He, and he's got this weird combination of Abrahamic faiths where he's sort of like uh, Islamic slash Judaic slash Christian like blend. So he and he doesn't use a computer. He still uses like freaking like a fax machine. Like get out of here, man. He sounds like Alan Moore at this point. He's almost like Alan Moore, but whereas Alan Moore went towards like the black art of magic, right. he went the towards the like magic. Abrahamic yeah faith. <laughs> so I don't know. Very weird. Uh, strange cat. It'd be fun to meet him someday, but um, he had like a. He did a ton of acid in 1979 and actually got hospitalized. <laughs> like seriously, this is like you could look it up. 1979, he went to an insane asylum, and ever since, and like people said, like ever since then, that's kind of like where a lot of this may have come from. Is this weird, like unhinged, snap, like maybe borderline schizophrenic, like you know, problem with so don't do a lot, don't do that much acid. Uh, another great one. Take your acid in moderation, kids. <laughs> Just little by little. I don't have, I wish I had a bigger edition, but Paul Pope is a savior of comics. Paul Pope's THB comics are, if you really feel like dropping a good amount of your uh, earnings on comic books, these, these collect these bad boys. And they're hard to find, that's yeah. for sure. This is probably annoying to any comic book guy because I'm sitting here smoking on it. I don't keep it in a bag and board. It's this annoying. thing is like... <laughs> it's annoying to me and I'm right next to you. I was trying to find a second copy of this. It's like hundreds of dollars for this issue. THB 6B. I'm sitting here. I'm gonna smoke on it. <laughs> Physically on. Physically smoke. It. I'm adding smoke. This is not a smoke-free environment. Nope. It's not in an acid-free uh, bag. No. No. I'm just letting no, it yellow LR's with age. It's a newsprint. <laughs> this guy's art is fantastic. Look I it just, up. When I flew to Florida to visit family just a few few weeks ago, I was at a comic book shop in Santa Ana because I flew out of JFK over there, uh -huh. and uh, I bought El Scapo. Oh, uh, so good. By Paul Pope. Yeah. I had never read it before, and there was a hardcover of it for like $25, and I had a bunch of extras in the back, and I was so super excited, and I, I went through that whole shop and couldn't find a damn thing, and then I found that like five minutes before we were going to leave, and oh, yeah. I read it in my layover in Atlanta, and I was extremely happy. He's, he's a, a very, like, an underrated writer, and yeah. he's so he's such an independent artist. <clears throat> You know he does on like double up size too. He doesn't do the typical eleven by seventeen. I love that. He does like massive size pages. Because then when I want to buy them, oh my I God. get this huge you, thing of amazing you, art. Oh, I would love a page of any Paul Pope stuff. I just I just bought a, a Ninja Turtle page from Mateus Santa Loco, who's a guy from Brazil, uh -huh. who's done some of the best turtles work that I've probably seen for a very very long time, uh, and. The, the page that I bought was actually two pages. It was like page three and four, but they were both on 11 by 17. Like he scaled down enough to fit two pages on one. Oh. And so I felt like I, I kind of got a deal, but at the same time, I felt like I got gypped because yeah. everything was so small. No. And it just wasn't. That's like a time saving deal. technique that a lot of artists do. Yeah. I did it myself for a few pages of Gassy Jack issue two, and they look like grapple. So don't do that. Do that's the big why no size, one has man. seen that issue, right? <laughs> that's true. That's why I'm not bothered to do anything with it. Um, okay, and then one other artist that I really would like to try to promote uh, is Sophie Campbell. 
Thank you. Who created Wet Moon. Uh, this is volume six. I got all the volumes and I pre ordered issues. Or they're ed- in the pile. Episode seven. Yeah, they're in the pile. I don't feel like digging through it anymore. Yeah, don't. Go ahead. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not not just going to fall. No, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> just to prove that I got him. He doesn't want to bullshit. I don't want to BS you guys. Yes. I'm not lying to you, all right? I got him. They're so good. Okay, <laughs> now this comic, when I, fr- I first read uh, volume one, there was a kind of almost a sub uh, like a subgenre of comics that were black and white gothic comics. Yeah. And Wet Moon came out in the ape, like the sort of heyday of that. I would say goth goth kid, not necessarily gothic. Yeah. Okay. Like, goth, I felt goth like kid. It, was, it, was the... it wasn't gothic like Frankenstein. Right. But exactly. it was like yeah, it was yeah. like hot topic goth kid. Yeah. It was what we were all experienced or living around at oh, the time. Man. <laughs> the first thing that I saw by Sophie Campbell's okay, written and drawn. And um, the first standout thing to me when I first checked out Volume One was yeah. how well <laughs> the rips in clothing were drawn. Like this right here, like a ripped clothing. It was like the most attentive detail to ripped nylons that I've ever seen. And I've never, it, it, ever since then, I've tried to draw like that because it's just it looks so natural and good. I like right here on the back. You probably can't see it, but just look at that. I mean, is that awesome or what? That's, it's well done. That's it's it. got That's the little cool. like strings and whatnot. And yep. Yeah. It's issue six. So issue one, like the art style sort of changed over time. Uh, this is the he main grew. character. She grew. Sorry. Yeah, she. Yeah, it's cool. Like the characters grew. The well, the art style grew, but the characters yeah. also grow. So they grow and evolve. The art style uh, <coughs> has changed slightly, but oh man, this it's is just matured. I would say. Yeah, definitely matured. Yeah. And this is a series that it it's another one that requires multiple readings. It's almost it's in this cool, almost like manga size format. It's not quite manga. But not quite full size comic. What size is this? Like six by five by seven or something? I don't know. It's cool. It's very. It's smaller size, but very dark and it's uh, introspective and it's very um, a lot of obviously like personal storytelling happening without being an autobiographical comic. But um, you could definitely tell a lot of the, the just the this sort of feeling of being an outsider. There's this undercurrent of horror, but it's not a horror. I don't know how to describe it. It's just like a totally unique comic reading experience. That depression of horror. Yeah, you know, like, the depression of being a teenager. Yeah. And the depression of, yeah, the sort of like, the, the sort of like, this very like, uh, there's a lot of dread. There, everything seems like something really bad is about to happen. There's a lot of really dark things, but, and while there are some bad things that happen, it's also very uplifting yeah, and kind of positive. Sometimes the dread never actually comes to a point, yeah. but you feel it for quite a while, and then all of a sudden something happier happens, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah. it's okay, I feel better now. <laughs> it's, yeah, and it's it's just like a genre of one. It's almost like Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. So many people yes. try to copy that. Like, uh, it's, I feel like slave labor graphics basically like turned the industry into that, it's, where they tried to find any artist that could do, could kind of ape it. I think what like Vasquez was doing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, Johnny the Homicidal Maniac was, like, the one, it, and it's been, it's in, like, how many, I don't know how many printings, and it still sells out when it gets reprinted, but, I know you know, it's like, seven, Roman Dirge right? kind of was, like, a shoot-off yes. of that, Lenore, his series, yep. and then, um, what are some other good examples? There's a lot of different ones, but um, none of them, none of them really quite capture what Jonan was able to do. Is that even how you pronounce it? Is it Jonin? I think so. I don't know. What the hell? Who the hell's name is Jonin? What the hell kind of name is that? The last, the last time I, I met hate that him, name. It's a name. John. I, we were at <laughs> John. His name is John. Okay, you know he had no control over what his name was. Tiff, that is right. He did always change control. Until he turned eighteen. Until he turned eighteen. That's true. My mom told me to change my middle name, and I never did. I had the choice though. But what is it? Danger. Yes, it is now. <laughs> it's what I changed it to. Another good story by Sophie that we should mention. Oh yeah, is, is uh, Water, Baby. Water Baby, which well actually there's also a poster in Volume Six of this. Where it but Water Baby, okay, yeah, pick up. I think it's Volume Six, Volume Five or Six. I can't remember. I don't know. I gotta flip through it, but got I don't want to do it on camera. Look. Give me six. Give me take six. Take a peek. But definitely in Water Baby, you might happen to see a poster on the wall. Okay, so first off, the fr- even from back in in Volume One. Sophie uh, had tons of references to Bella Morte, who is a, a great band that I love, kind of an in- influence. I remember when we were driving around one time, I was trying to pitch it to Jason. Uh, I put a CD in, and he's like, wasn't into it, but he said the singer sounded like me. Which band? <laughs> Bella Morte. Bella Morte? Oh, yeah, I was all right. Well, no. The singer doesn't sound like me. I wish I could sound like that. The singer's like a They're operatically very trained rock. singer. Yeah, good, good death rock, man. Oh, awesome band. Bella Morte is me too. fantastic. Everybody check them out. But there's a lot of like Bella Morte references and posters in here. But 
<laughs> Water baby. Okay, so I, I did a, I actually, when I put out my self-published comic book, which, you know, I hate promoting, so I didn't even bring an issue out here. So I did a comic book called Ghastly Jack, and I um, got a booth at Comic-Con. It was awesome. It was probably one of the <laughs> coolest things I've ever done. And um, met Sophie there. Gave uh, Sophie a copy of a 7-inch and a copy of the comic. And... Yeah. Lo and behold, I met Steve that day. Yeah. Steve, and, Steve and Kevin. Do you remember what happened that day? It was a special day in our relationship. Oh, wow. no, I don't. Wait, what did happen wow. that day? I don't remember. Jason I don't came know. Back did we get band. married? Did we marry each other? That would be, did we hand fast each other in a wicked hand fasting ceremony? In our two year breakup, the two years that we spent apart, that'd be the first and time. And he wanted I saw to kiss you, you again. Hugged. Oh, yeah. That's, man oh, dang it. You know what? That was the story that I wanted to talk about, but you're off camera. Just kidding. Remember that yeah. time? It will be the story when Remember we go back. That you know, it's another one. Of history of a yeah, that's life. true. How about yeah. Irwindale? Remember Irwindale AM PM coffee yeah, morning? As a matter of fact, I do. That's what I remember. What are you doing here? I worked down the street. <laughs> Me too. That's what I'm talking about. That's how you know that it was meant to be, baby. But it was that Comic Con. That's true. That I totally Comic-Con forgot about that. You're right. That was yep. that wrote it all back together. Oh, man. I totally forgot that. That's awesome. Comics. That's why comics are good. Comics are good, yep. and uh, Wet Moon issue uh, or Volume Six is not the poster. How about five? Let's try five. Well, let's try five while you continue to talk about water. I thought it was earlier on, Might like four or Anywho, three. Sophie was kind enough to uh, put a little Lord of the Fly reference in there. Definitely in Water Baby, there's a Lord of the Fly poster, and then it's also in one of the Wet Moons. Uh, so please, if you're interested whatsoever, I know that Oni Press uh, reprinted all these volumes. Brand new volumes with um, cool new cover art, so check them out. Uh, it's amazing, so good. And I'm not just saying that because our posters in there. I'm it's saying it because I'm a mega fan. It's just so good. Is this supposed so to blink red? Uh, that means the battery's dying. So that's okay. It's perfect. S- Sophie did some really great uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles artwork yep. in the current IDW series. So check that out as well. And I'm not a big fan of Gem and the Holograms, but yeah. the Gem and the Hologram series and the art Gem style the just for the art style is good. If you want to see some cool ripped nylons, that's the best part. Rip nylons and really well done lips. There are a lot of rip nylons. And rip nylons and lips. That's Sophie Campbell's bread and butter right there. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta just bask in like these lips. Every goth girl in these books has the biggest lips you could ever imagine. Big, luscious lips and ripped jeans and nylons drawn so like. Don't you hate perfect. jeans and nylons? Huh? <laughs> Don't you hate jeans and nylons? I do, but not in this not comic. In comics. Not in this God, comic. It's so good. I mean, it's just, it's just you can't stop looking at the accuracy with which rips are drawn. It's just amazing. It's, it's true. So good. That is true. It's like literally the th- first thing I saw. I just remember being like, look at the rips in the knees of those nylons. It's amazing. There what? you go. Jason got it right. The internet is oh, explaining the to us how to say Jonan Vasquez's name. It is Jonan Vasquez. It's got a G. What kind of German yeah, is this? It's it's out of does Germany. that for some reason? You're an American. It's Jonan. Okay. I'm an American. Yeah. Okay, but well, that's our comic book uh, issue for the week. Uh, or the month. We're gonna do another comic book one, and the next time we're gonna discuss swamp monsters. Yeah, there, yes. There's so many, and we're gonna talk about the top ten yes. swamp monsters. Because that'll there. also bring me into my obsession with Airboy, another independent comic book. True. Which. The most current series that was done by James Robinson and Greg Hanks. Oh, yeah, that'd was, be good. <laughs> it was my first introduction to Airboy, which is nothing is like the rest of the Airboy series, oh, but I, I loved wait. it so much. And there was a lot of controversy on one specific issue. Yeah. And I speci- I actually sat and talked to Greg Hinkle at Comic Con in 2016, I believe, which is right around the same time this was happening. And he was explaining to me how it sucked. That everyone thought that they were, you know, either transphobic it's or homophobic high, our, or this or that, and it's the society. Of it today. wasn't. I, I didn't. It, I didn't take it that way. Although no. I'm not a trans person, sure. so maybe I would have taken it that way if I had been. But I took it as. I mean, it was. It was done tongue in cheek. I mean, it was. You got to be able to look. No matter who you are or what your identity is, or how much oppression you face, right. you have to be able to have a little bit of self-deprecating humor. I. Laugh at nothing more yeah, in this time. world than yeah. myself. All right, I, I am my favorite butt of every joke. Right. You gotta laugh at yourself, guys. And your so butt. don't torpedo a brilliant piece of art like that great Airboy series was, uh, for one thing. But I mean, you know, it's a touchy subject, so maybe I don't understand it. But we're white males. So uh, yeah, that's true. Society says we will not understand yes. it. Yes, on the progressive stack, we are definitely very low. We're on the first tier, so we don't get it. But you know, whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I don't get that. I, I, you know, we'll spend a whole episode talking about it another yes. day. So. My belief is that everybody should be valued for being an individual. I don't like this idea of lumping us all into these little individual tribes, but that's most. Of, that's all I'm going to say about this. 
We're all one. We're all humans. Just read the bar of a freaking Dr. Bronner soap, all right? All one. <laughs> In fact, everybody, that's after you read comics, if They'll you read comics, you're probably a sweaty neck beard. Dr. Go Bronner buy soap. a bar of Dr. Bronner soap <laughs> and read the bottle. Read the bar or the bottle, and you will understand. It'll take you. We are all one. All right, all one. Right? That means all of us are one. We are not individual tribes. We're not different. All right, we're all one. Isn't that beautiful? It's very. That's beautiful. how we're gonna end it. I'm very happy that my soap can explain to me life. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to go to church when you open your soap and it it's right there. Cleanse your body and your mind. Know. Cleanliness is godliness. Yeah. And we are all one. That's all you need in life. You know that Dr. Bronner, when he died, like he didn't really even care about the soap. Here's a little tidbit. He uh, didn't even care about the soap, but he passed it on to his kids. And the one stipulation is, like you can do whatever with the company, but you have to have <laughs> that stuff on the bottle. Go get a bottle of Dr. Bronner soap, everybody. It smells pepperminty and delicious. You can use it for everything. You can brush your teeth with it. You I don't. Wash your dishes I with do it. Huh? Can't you do Wash your dishes with Yeah, you can do dishes. Yeah, you can do uh, yeah, you can do probably you can do internal oh, really? feminine cleaning. You probably can. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you could probably yeah. put it in a, a, yeah. a gravity fed uh, enema if you needed to. <laughs> I'm not going to stop going, you from oh, doing that. If you feel like safe. doing it, go for it. It might be good. I mean, who doesn't want a peppermint smelling anus? <laughs> right? <laughs> I wish mine smelled like peppermint. It doesn't. That's true. It's Me definitely too. not but if it did, quite there. Yeah. It'd be good. Okay, so that's it for this evening. Uh, thanks for tuning in. On that note, <laughs> Pepper have a wonderful Davis. day. That's Go buy some comics and enjoy. <laughs> please, please, please look up all those comics I told you about and go to your comic book store if you are a comic fan and ask them to please purchase all the alternative comics you can get. Give them to the kids. Get them into reading comics. It's a great art form. It's not just for kids, but kids are the ones that need to carry this torch. They I need to just get off the internet. I my granddaughter. Yeah, right I'm so now, proud of you. while I was sitting here. You did? She sat here. Yeah. I'm going to give you Why don't you have some the of these? Phone yeah, she, for uh, her granddaughter. You, get, you take that I stack of little dark. dark you know, while we were sitting here and talking. Oh, about. see, that's magical. You know, you know we're doing a good thing, Ralph. We are doing a good thing. We're spreading the love, man. We're spreading. We're, yeah, good. I'm proud of us. God damn. Proud of you. Man. Good job, buddy. You did a good thing today. Both of us did a good thing today. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Okay, that was our episode. We're going to go practice and uh, take care. Bye. Oh, good. <laughs> 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 for like fucking 20 minutes. Look at this pile of junk I made. <laughs>